Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sewell Chan. I'm a journalist and the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune, a nonprofit newsroom based in Austin, Texas. I'm so delighted to be here today to moderate uh, this discussion, Citizens United, Creating Community in America, with two fantastic authors I really admire, Gall Beckerman, who is a writer and editor at the New York Times Book Review, and Catherine Judge, who is a professor at the Columbia Law School. Um, Gall, let's start with your book. Uh, this is actually the second time I've moderated yes. this talk <laughs> with you. Uh, in your book, The Quiet Before, you take us, the reader, on a broad romp um, of, through the world of ideas from 17th century uh, uh, France all the way through to the streets of Tahrir Square, um, Occupy Wall Street, and the streets of Minneapolis. One of the things you talk about is the kind of network effects that enable um, ideas to, to generate and build on each other in a way that's a lot harder to do online mm. where you know it's hard to get that you know momentum out of a tweet or a post. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, the arguments you make in your book. Yeah, well, so the impetus for the book was really a feeling that I had that social movements were, uh, that we were seeing in our, in our moment, social movements that seemed to sort of burn very bright very briefly and then sort of flare out. And, uh, you know, sometimes they would leave a national conversation for us to have, but the activists at the center of these movements often felt that they weren't getting, achieved the goals that they wanted to, to achieve. And I came to understand this as almost a communications problem, right? Because uh, if you ask people where a movement starts, where a movement incubates, they would say, the social media, right? You just put a tweet out there, if it goes viral, if it gains enough attention, uh, if enough people respond to it emotionally, even if you get enough people out into the streets as a result, that's a successful movement. But it isn't really. Uh, it, it doesn't allow for the kind of sustainability that a movement actually needs to make real concrete change on the ground. And activists themselves were seeing this. So as a way of sort of understanding this communication problem, I said, let me do what I usually do when I feel sort of stuck in the present, which is let's look to the past uh, and understand sort of in a pre-digital age what forms of communication, what kind of media did people use when they wanted to begin to develop and grow a, a radical notion, some idea that would end up, uh, you know, upending a status quo, knock down some orthodoxy, uh, say, you know, ending slavery or giving women the right to vote. You know, uh, what tools did they use to actually come together? And so this took me on the journey that you described, you know, starting with letters before the scientific revolution, uh, going through petitions in England, you know, and, and, the, and the, the effort of the working class to get the right to vote, uh, and to, to to Af pre-independence Africa and small newspapers. Each, each moment had a medium sort of at its center and a group of people using that medium to come together. Uh, going all the way to, to the 1990s and zines, if people remember those, and Riot Girl and the kind of birth of third wave feminism. So that exploration of the past, of, of these historical moments of what I call in the book incubation, for lack of a better <laughs> term to describe it, um, they, they elicited for me like a bunch of qualities that a medium needs to have uh, to really create the sort of sustainable, long-lasting kind of movements that are really going to make change. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about what those are later, but, you know, I, 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 things like patience, things like allowing cohesion, allowing focus, giving people a chance to imagine together, to, uh, to, to, to really plot in a way that might be a little bit, you know, private, you know, and not so public and performative as our platforms are today. Uh, that g gave me almost a toolkit for understanding what was missing online today and where we might sort of find possibility in terms of, of, of social movement sort of building up again. Fantastic. Yeah. Catherine, your book is really a tour de force. Um, walk, working through it, I really came, saw how the e modern economy has came together, has come together over the last four or five decades. And you really describe so vividly kind of what has changed in terms of our consumption habits, uh, our assumptions about abundance and also waste, um, you know, the, the power of concentrated, you know, capitalism. Um, what, what got you started on this, on this look at the middleman economy, and could you start by defining it? Of course, uh, and 
I might actually take those in reverse order. Um, so, so my work originally is in banking and financial regulation. And anybody who's studied the financial system knows that it's been absolutely not right. trans. Is that better? Yeah. All right. So, uh, so my work is in banking and financial regulation. And anybody who spent time studying finance knows that the entire field has really been transformed starting around 1980. It used to be that we had a lot of small community-based banks and thrifts, and they really did take local deposits and circulate them into the local community. And it was a relationship-based system which made them more willing to make loans, for example, to small businesses that were risky, but where they were building a relationship. And then what we saw were two shifts. One, you went from having these small community banks to having a half dozen banks that dominate the entire banking system and play an outsized role, uh, both providing financial services and shaping policy. Um, and they also had a different way of banking, where they use all of their resources and data to effectively standardize the lending process. And that, in turn, enabled securitization and these other innovations that suddenly allowed these very long and complex capital supply chains where you suddenly had you know, uh, investors in Europe and in Asia filtering money into to US housing. And in the short run, this created all kinds of efficiencies, or it seemed to create efficiencies. Uh, we saw in the, the mid-aughts that actually the housing ownership rates were going up. The racial disparity was going down. It seemed like this great thing. And of course, then the other shoe dropped. And what we realized was, in addition to seemingly to create efficiencies and benefits, there was actually an incredible amount of fragility that was built up because the process of commoditization resulted in incredible information losses. We generally think Hayek, you know, markets create information, but you look at the structures, and instead it was producing information gaps. And those information gaps caused dysfunction to create more dysfunction, uh, leading both to the crisis, which resulted in incredible long-term pain for the economy, for, for most Americans, exacerbated racial wealth differences, uh, and also a lack of accountability. Uh, there was widespread uh, fraud but, or, or, or bad actions and um, predatory lending practices, but very little ability to hold anybody high up accountable. And then I look beyond finance, and we see these exact same trends. So, you know, we, like, I'm looking here at my aunt. You know, we have relatives in Illinois who are farmers. Uh, you know, I, like, regularly try to, like, buy food uh, where I know where it comes from, and I realized how hard that was to do. And what's interesting in the United States, you still have family farms as actually the norm. Um, and you have individual consumers, and yet in between, we have companies like Cargill that has produced more billionaires than any other company anywhere in the world. You look at retail, and we see Amazon and Walmart are the two biggest revenue generators uh, in the entire country. They're the two biggest employers in the entire country, and there's incredible gains from this, or appearing gains. They appear to create efficiencies. They certainly make goods cheaper, our lives easier, and everything more convenient. But their scale also demands a different production process. And so it's actually the, the book, in direct, I really explore how in the process of demanding all the scale, you actually get a disaggregation of production. So while we talk a lot about corporate concentration and power, and I think we need to have those conversations, and it shows why that's so important, particularly for intermediaries, it actually maps out the concentration has, and, and the growing power of these entities has simultaneously been fed and is feeding a diffusion of responsibility and a, an ability to actually hold people accountable. So if you want to know where your food was grown, if you want to know about the working conditions behind the people who, who made the clothes that you're wearing, it's actually almost impossible to learn these days. And then I'm kind of trying to provide a more hopeful tone at the end that hopefully we can get to. But it is looking in sector after sector of how we've had this growth, and this goes back to the definition of the middleman economy. It's not just an economy with middlemen, it's an economy where you have these really large and powerful middlemen and the long and complex supply chains uh, that help to, to feed their dominance and the way these two phenomenon feed off of each other and, and really have transformed our economy. Um, thinking about the title of the book, Creating Community, um, I'm curious about your thoughts, Gal, on the, on the internet. Um, you know, you point out the limits to a kind of hashtag activism. And you also point out that the internet is, in a way, the medium that is kind of wiping out almost all prior mediums. Does that make it impossible to develop the kinds of social movements 
and political movements and revolutions and ideas that characterize the past? I don't necessarily think so. I'm not, you know, one of these cyber pessimists that thinks that you should, we should just unplug, partly because I know that that's just not possible. People are not going to do that. And also I think that we need to have a more nuanced, complex understanding of what the internet is good for and what different tools it provides us. So I, I, I would hope that the awareness that people emerge from my book with is not uh, let's never do activism online, but let's think carefully about, say, what is a Twitter or Facebook or or, you know, other large social media platform good for. You know, it's good for being a bullhorn, right? It's, it's really effective at calling everybody to the square or to the street at the same time. It's really good for uh, refining a very good three-word blurby, uh, you know, slogan that, has a, that, that embodies a narrative of a movement that you can kind of, that can ping around very fast among a lot of people. Um, but it's not good at strategizing, at building cohesion, at taking what's often a very sort of emotional triggers for movements and turning them into strategy, whether it be legislative strategy or, you know, or just figuring out sort of where should we protest and who should we, what, what, what levers should we pull in any particular moment. So what I hope people learn to do, and I actually think that young people are beginning to understand this more than, than, than those of us who are kind of older and are still dazzled by the internet and what it can do, is, is, is think carefully about where we speak online. You know, so, um, you know, I have a chapter on, on Black Lives Matter activists in, in Minneapolis and in Florida, and, and they went through this interesting trajectory of sort of seeing their movements gain incredible visibility and attention, and then feeling, in many cases, like the goals that they had for, say, police reform weren't effectuated. Yep. And so they, they, they understood you know, this problem of social media, of just sort of getting sucked into this sense that, you know, all we need to do is, is, is gain visibility and that's all, you know, that, that, that'll sort of make the movement. And they've retracted and said, let's focus on who gets elected to the city council, on who the DA is, you know, on, on, on coming up with proposals that the community all buys into, which means going door to door, getting petitions signed. It's an older form of organizing in a way. But in terms of online, you know, a lot of these groups have told me they now have their like small chat app, you know, WhatsApp group, let's say, or signal group, where there's maybe eight or 10 people who talk about, who are in the core, you know, who talk about strategy in a more concentrated, focused way, aren't distracted by lots of different things. And they know that that's, it's, that's really good for that sort of work. And then, you know, once they've developed an idea, they can disseminate it through different avenues. But just having a sense of the different tools that we can pick up online, I think is, is it might seem like, like an obvious conclusion, but I think we, we, we are often distracted by the loud and the performative and the, and the quick, and don't realize that there are ways of being sort of slow and focused and intimate online. Well, speed is actually a theme that gets me thinking about Catherine's book. You know, Catherine, ours is a society obsessed with ordering, having a wide array of consumer choices, um, mostly of cheap exported goods, being able to order them instantaneously and have either same day delivery or next day delivery. Obviously, the vast majority of Americans already use Amazon, and Amazon Prime in particular is, uh, is you know, both kind of the lifeblood of the company but also um, something that so many millions of Americans have come to rely upon. Can you reflect on the trade-offs between fast, cheap, and, plenty, and, a, you know, and lots of choice and, and, and the downside of that? Yeah, I mean, so the first step is just to recognize that there are trade-offs, right? Um, it's so easy to fall into the dominant system without thinking about the ramifications of that choice. And part of what direct documents is that the benefits are often immediate, but the price that you pay is often long-term, and the benefits are often tangible and individualized to you, whereas the cost is diffuse, and it's one that you yourself are gonna pay, but oftentimes over time. So if you think about the rise of Amazon, I mean, it, it is. The, the majority of Americans, I think, at this point are Prime members. And of course, once you're a Prime member, the process of going back is easier and easier and easier. And once Amazon grows in dominance, uh, it squeezes out the alternatives that used to exist. 
So for any individual to go outside of it becomes more difficult and more difficult and more difficult. And so the challenge is how do we mediate between them? And kind of I think like all my overall approach is a little more pragmatic. It's, it's not that we're going to get back to a world where we go direct to the producer uh, every time we want a good, but that is kind of the seed that I plant as a way of understanding how much is at stake in that threshold question of through whom do we buy, through whom, through whom do we invest? And then understanding how the current structures really leave us systematically blinded to the impact of our actions on others, the impact of our actions on the planet that we all inhabit, and how a, even a little bit of going to the opposite extreme just helps to reawaken the awareness uh, that, that really has been dulled by the current system. And that not only kind of helps to rebalance the system, but also leads to the awareness that I think we really need to have the political will to bring about more sustained and systematic changes, where again, we're not getting away from being online, we're not getting away from a world of middlemen and intermediation, but where there's at least a meaningful rebalancing of power so that more of the control, more of the choice really lies in the hands of creators and consumers, and less of the power lies with the middlemen that, that have come to play such an outsized role, shaping our economy and our lives in ways that we don't always appreciate. For both of you, I'd like to know whether government has a role to play. Gall, I would ask about, you know, for the internet, should things like Section 230 be revisited? Should the government, as regulators are doing in, in other places like the European Union, take a role in kind of, you know, regulating hateful or dangerous speech or misinformation, kind of creating a healthier or safe ecosystem? And then to Catherine, should the government be playing a, a greater role in enforcing antitrust? and breaking up these kinds of very, very large companies that, that control so much of the economy? Yes. <laughs> um, I think... That was easy. Yes. I think, uh, the internet has become our public sphere, right? It's, it's, and, and specifically, these large social media platforms are, are the place where ideas circulate. And, Every public sphere needs its, and historically, and I'm not saying this just because this is my own uh, feeling, being online and being bom feeling bombarded often and, and worrying about the direction of discourse, but just historically, there's always been a sense of these are the guardrails, this is what's permitted, this is what's not permitted. I, I have a chapter on the very early days, sort of pre, actually pre-internet, when, 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 when communicating online in real time meant dialing up into a modem. Bulletin boards. Bulletin boards, the well. exactly. Exactly. So I have a chapter on The Well, which was this first uh, real attempt to bring people together in this way. It was very weird to them that they were interacting in a kind of a disembodied way online, talking to each other. And literally the second day, they said, hold on, we need some rules here, OK? You know, there was a troll on day three, you know? <laughs> they, they, you know and, and there was a constant sense of communication behind the scenes. They were moderators. There were people moderating this space to make sure that the talk was productive, uh, that it actually didn't, uh, you know, pull, push into the worst instincts of people who are communicating without seeing each other face to face. Uh, they would make efforts to see each other as a kind of a corollary. This is a small group. It's not, you know, the thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people that are on Twitter, let's say. But, but. But, but those instincts were there right away, that this is a new way that we're communicating, um, so we need some rules here. But also, you know, that, is, that has always been the underlying notion behind a public sphere, that, uh, and going back to, you know, the Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, you know, illuminating this idea in the coffee houses of Europe, it, it was never a sense of just a free-for-all, and that one person can sort of uh, hijack a situation to say whatever whatever they they want. It is a group of people coming together, just like any group of people comes together and decides. You know, this is what this is. This is how we're going to talk to each other. Yeah. Uh, isn't there a profound sense of how of disillusionment over how the early internet culture has kind of been replaced by these social media dominated silos, or even worse, by forums like 8chan, where people are spreading right. Uh, misinformation about COVID, misinformation about the climate. 
and misinformation about our democracy? Well, I think, you know, there is a romanticism that emerged from that early internet, which was we can all meet each other online, you know, uh, around our common interests, and isn't this a beautiful thing that we didn't have before? And it is, but there was a corollary to that romanticism, and it was this sense of, oh, this is a new and uncharted way of human beings communicating to each other. We need to be very thoughtful and very deliberate about how we do this. That sort of was forgotten a bit, and, or a lot. And, and instead, this kind of uh, you know, free speech absolutism you know, kind of took over um, in our thinking about what kind of speech it goes on online, and especially as things scaled up to such an enormous degree. So it's not, you know, a bunch of professors and futurists in the Bay Area that are talking on the well, it's everybody. You know, we, we lost that initial insight, I feel like, that, that, that really did characterize the, the early internet. Catherine, what about the government? Should the government have a role in curbing the power of these middlemen? So yes, <laughs> I think it's the, the right answer for, for, for most of these questions. Um, and then the question is, what does that role look like? And I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of one of those roles, and that is more vigorous enforcement of antitrust law, which both means, I think, trying to revisit the law as it stands, figure out where it needs to be built out, but also, as we're currently seeing happen, I think, with the Biden administration, really an effort to unearth the original aims of those laws and to reclaim those purposes where what much broader in terms of political engagement and a balance of power than they've often been interpreted uh, in recent decades. And so there's a clear role of the government in that, that top-down way of leveling the playing field. But I also think there's a lot that the federal government, but also state and local governments, uh, are doing and more that they could do to help level the playing field from the bottom up. Um, I mean, so, so I talk a little bit about farmer markets and these community-sponsored gardens as a way of trying to connect directly and understand the source of things. But of course, most farmer markets are happening on street corners throughout New York, but also really on cities throughout the, the country. And the government plays a role in making those spaces available. And so part of what the book explores is intermediaries play this critical role, uh, helping to overcome all of the challenges, the logistical challenges, the informational challenges uh, that bring creators and connect, uh, consumers together. Well, the government can really play a role helping to restore more meaningful choice for people on both sides of those chains by helping to create that infrastructure. So you talked before, for example, about Amazon. At this point, Amazon has this amazing fleet of warehouses and trucks, and so does Walmart, actually. And that makes it just so much easier and faster to go to Amazon than to go anywhere else. And meanwhile, for the, the US Postal Service, I think is trying to make some very healthy changes, and Congress is trying to help them. But you know, we're trying to make it so they can actually make their ends meet, as opposed to using it as a public service. And so what are they doing? They're stretching out delivery times. And so yeah, it used to be three days for a first class package. Now it could be four or five days. Well, it makes it that much harder to opt out. So another way that the government can really come in is to say we're going to subsidize and really support the public infrastructure that we need to maintain meaningful choice if people want to do something than go to Amazon, where they're still going to have to wait a little longer and pay perhaps a little bit more. But the cost of opting out can be meaningfully reduced by the government coming in and not telling people where to go, but creating the infrastructure that allows kind of that balance of power to stay at a more healthy balance than I think it is right now. Catherine, what about the argument that you hear all the time that, well, goods are cheap and we like our, we like our convenience, you know, we like our fast fashion, our fast food. Um, there's fascinating numbers about clothing waste in the U.S., which are really, really astonishing. Um, what, what's wrong with that argument? I mean, so part of what's really interesting to think about is to take a step back. Uh, and one of the things actually I really liked about Gall's book is one of his points about this incuba incubation environment is you can experiment. Mm. And so part of uh, what I invite and direct is for people to experiment on what really ends up feeling meaningful and where joy ends up coming from. And so we do have these astounding numbers when you really look at it, where goods have gotten far cheaper and food has gotten far cheaper. And guess what? We consume more. We buy a lot more clothing. We throw away a lot more clothing. We consume more food. I mean, there's some really interesting empirical work that shows when a new Walmart or Supercenter pops up 
that actually waistlines in that area go get bigger. Like we, we really do eat more. And I think there's this question of well, what is the optimal level of consumption? And so a lot of the, the infrastructure we have was built upon the scarcity mindset of there's not enough, so therefore we need to build more efficient systems so we all have more. Right. But now we're living in a world where we all have more and everybody's overwhelmed by having more. And so trying to figure out well, how do we actually create a balance that serves us individually and serves us collectively, I think is the challenge that we have going forward. And it's helping us to, to develop a better set of tools for more thoughtfully engaging in those choices. Whereas right now, I mean, I think who we are and our desires are co-determined by the environments that we're in. And we're taught to constantly want more and want cheaper goods and want more goods. Uh, but I think we're already seeing a rebellion. Um, and that's another thing I think our books had in common is we we're, we're both writing on areas where there's a dominant system, yeah. but there's a lot of evidence of dissatisfaction with that dominant system because it provided exactly what it was meant to. It created it so it was easier for us to communicate. So yeah, we got all these incredibly cheap goods and now we're sitting there and we're like, wait, are we any happier? And, and the answer oftentimes is no. That's right. I'd, I'd add to that, you know, Robert Putnam's research on social anomie mm -hmm. and the, the kind of disappearance of traditional institutions. I think a lot of Americans of whatever political persuasion and wherever they live would agree that local communities don't feel the way they used to. Yeah. Um, there are fewer, you know, um, civic associations, um, fewer bo pure people bowling together as, <laughs> as, as Bob Putnam um, explained even youth sports participation in some areas has declined. Uh, church attendance, of course, is declining. And public spheres have not been very really invested in, and by that I mean public spaces, yeah. uh, parks, libraries, museums. How do we, how do we turn this around? Because it, the, to me, the, t the, the, the reason why so many people are perhaps in their basement playing video games or in their basement doing online shopping perhaps is partly a response to a feeling of, of, of that community bonds have withered, and of course COVID didn't help anything. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is to understand that you often need a medium. You need a way to bring people together. You know, I, I have this, there's, I, I found this wonderful metaphor that Hannah Arendt uh, uses in the, in the human condition. Of the applause for Hannah Arendt. <laughs> <laughs> this is my kind of crowd. Um, she, in the human condition, she talks about, she's looking at, at what are those sort of binding agents that holds a society together, and her metaphor is uh, a table, right? She said, if you have people sitting around a table, they've come together, let's imagine that that table suddenly disappears, right? You just have a random bunch of people just sort of standing around. That it's the table itself that has brought people together. And, and, and that notion of, of the need for a table, that need for people to come together, whether it's a library or a park or, uh, you know, or a book club uh, or a bowling league is, is, is really sort of key to our even thinking about the internet. Because, because I, we think of, of what we're doing online as being parts of communities, but I really think we need to think about the features of what allows like real community to come together, what, what gives people an opportunity to speak their mind, to really see each other. You know, the, a lot of that just isn't happening on these, on these platforms in these mediums that we sort of imagine are supposed to do that job. So to me, the first thing is to really uh, a kind of a self-awareness, um, a self-awareness that will push back against some of the things we've been talking about, you know, just the drive for efficiency, for, for, for quickness, and also, you know, performativity, <laughs> you know, that, that, that it's not just about, you know, one person speaking to lots of people, it's thinking about creating structures where people can speak to each other or, or among, and, and you know, we've had these, I mean, the town hall, the coffee shop, you know, these are, these are, these are structures that have existed and some of the ones that I look at, you know, in, 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 in my book that are not person to person but are mediated through some form of, of communication like, uh, you, know, you, know, you, know, like, you know, like zines, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of gave people a chance to really both um, express themselves, but also communicate with one another. So, so thinking about how to recreate those, for, those, those, the, the medium, the, the table that, around which people can actually begin to have meaningful discussions. Yeah. So, I mean, starting from the the premise, I would say individual change and social change have to go hand in hand, mm -hmm. and it is an iterative and incredibly messy process. You know, and I. Understanding part of it means 
the, the increase in awareness of understanding our own individual culpability is that we have played a role, and each of us oftentimes has played a role, I play a role, contributing to the realities that I don't like that are currently surrounding my world. I mean, it's an incredible, the inequality is, is mind boggling. And yet, you know, when I'm in a hurry and I'm like trying to buy leggings for my girls, I'm just gonna like go online and get like, you know, whatever leggings I can find. And I'm like willing to spend more to like know where they come from. But you actually do the research on like fair trade and organic and it's actually really depressing because what we realize is we have this incredibly complex system that causes us to lose all this information and just slapping a label doesn't actually tell us anything. And so part of it is starting with this awareness, both so we can make different decisions, but then we can also band together collectively to bring about the structural changes that we need to help restore that community. And it, it is a really interesting challenge, I think, particularly in this moment. So a lot of direct traditionally has been based in geographically where we live. And there's an incredible value for that. And, and direct is always gonna be part of that. And, and I, I celebrate those spaces because those are the settings where the process of transacting and buying and selling can also feed into relationships of people that you're seeing in other parts of your life and where transaction, which we normally think about, well, you're a consumer, suddenly can be something other than a consumer, but you're a citizen and a member of the community coming together as different members of the community. Um, but we also want to live in a world that is incredibly segregated and hierarchical in very meaningful ways. And some of the benefits of things like globalization actually haven't been to make goods cheaper for us. It's to actually raise the quality of life in other parts of the world. And so I think the, the challenge going forward is both to focus on that local rebuilding of community, but also start to broadly conceive community in new ways yeah. and try to think, well, how can we harness a different type of understanding? And so I have some great examples of these books of these incredibly innovative entrepreneurs who are oftentimes harnessing their own kind of dual identities um, as a way of creating new companies where you have a, a, you know, a beauty company that is sourcing all of its shade directly from Ghana, but then they also have videos so you can see the women. And then they have these days where you give money, like you don't, you, you don't just like pay a premium and they don't just pay a premium for the good, but you can, vol you know, you can give money separately for the healthcare and people do it. And, and so what we're seeing is this shorter and much more accountable and transparent supply chain but where it's not just in a local way, and it's community that's being defined by people who have faced common oppressors and are now trying to, to reclaim who they are and thinking black owned is not actually about just black ownership, but the employees and everybody involved mm. in the production of a good. Um, and we're seeing that on a lot of different spaces in some really innovative ways. So again, it's, it's looking to the past, but also looking forward and trying to be much more thoughtful once we, we pay attention to to through whom as being something that, that we need to think about. Yeah. If you, if you have questions for Catherine or Gall, please uh, line up uh, uh, with these microphones and I will be certain to call on you. Let me get in one more question. What do we do about the, in, um, oh, but please, you can come up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about the institutions of today that are still with us but are withering. I'm thinking about, for example, newspapers and magazines, which have done so much to help foment a sense of community, but a lot are being eviscerated or, or even uh, eliminated because of you know the internet transforming everybody into kind of a national or global reading public. Yeah. And then for Catherine, you know, what do you think about the mom and pop stores and? the brick and mortar experiences and the local department stores, which used to be fixtures of their community, but have again withered. I should ask you this question soon. <laughs> you're, on the, you're on the front lines of this, uh, thinking of you know, nonprofit ways of, <laughs> of returning uh, journalism to communities. I, I mean, look, there's, uh, I, it kind of breaks my heart, you know, the story of small newspapers sort of disappearing and local newspapers, because I do think that they were incredibly important as sort of binding agents, you know, for, for the places where they existed. Um, but I also, you know, want to take this point that like we can't just look to the past, um, and there are business models that are obliterated, uh, ways of being even that we feel nostalgic about. Um, but but again, you know, we need what we need to do 
uh, as Catherine said, is sort of look to the future, see what is capable uh, with the new tools that we have, because we do have incredible new tools. Um, and in some ways, th there is possibilities. That's why I was saying that I'm curious what you think about this question. There are possibilities online for bringing people together in local ways, in small ways, um, in ways that feel like they recreate that sense of of community. I mean, there's even, you know, some of these, uh, you know, uh, platforms like Nextdoor, and I know that's not even the best one, one oh, of them, um, but there, there are a few like this that, 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 that actually recreate that functionality yeah. that the small newspaper had. If you're interested in nonprofit news, visit the website of the Institute for Nonprofit News, yeah. inn.org, and you'll find nonprofit newsrooms across America yeah. that are trying to do but, but I think, you know, the, the, the point of understanding the importance of those things, you know, I think that that's really what we're both driving home in some yeah. ways, that, that shifting the conversation from one of efficiency, of everything at the altar of efficiency, you know, to, to seeing that, you know, some of the friction that existed with those older forms was good. It was good for us. It created meaning uh, for people. So, yeah. And yeah, so to use the exact same phrase, I mean, it is work to go into a brick and mortar yeah, exactly. store, and that's a source of friction. Uh, if your goal is efficiency, which is getting as much as you possibly can as quickly as you can with as little work as possible. But if you recognize that that brick and mortar store can also be an opportunity for connection, for, for community building on both sides, uh, and where historically it has been. And we can look today, um, and we've seen that actually at this point, loneliness is almost as much of a, a public health epi epidemic yep. as, as obesity. And that was true even before COVID. Yep. It's certainly gotten worse, but it was true even before that. And so in trying to get everything we wanted with as much li like as little effort as possible, we were also feeding into this way that we became very isolated. And those frictions are actually oftentimes the point of human connection and opportunity and that little interaction. Uh, that actually can, can start to seed a different type of meeting, to seed a type of community, uh, to use the, the theme here. And so we think uh, this is the commonality, is we have these technologies that are great and we need to figure out how to harness them and harness them for the, the, the collective benefit, but we also need to be wary yeah. of where they can take us uh, and be aware that frictions are oftentimes where, where meaning really comes from. So I think that mom and pop store uh, is always gonna have a place but it's probably got, not going to be nearly the footprint that it was historically. Right. Yeah. And, and that balance is what we're going to have to forge. Question. Um, so your discussion about community and trying to build community brings me to mind uh, Heather McGee's thoughts about draining the pool and how so many of our public institutions, whether it's an actual pool or whether it's a library, these places where people can meet in community, have largely been spaces that have become politicized, I mean, you look at libraries today, many of whom have been forced to shut down because, heaven forbid, they have a book about LBTQ people. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about how you push past that and that desire of certain aspects of you know, society to drain the pool, to eliminate these public spaces where people who are marginalized can enter into and, heaven forbid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it is a sad phenomenon what you're describing, and I, I don't I, I, my only solution is for people to really think locally about about saving the institutions that matter to them, like like the pool or the library, you know. And um, you know, this I didn't write my book as a sort of a guidebook for activism necessarily. But the one thing that I have been able to say as a result of doing the research that I did is for people who want to get engaged, you know, choosing targets that are actually close to home and not thinking on this big national scale, you know, some of these very big conversations we have, you know, uh, that th th that is also something social media sort of pushes us towards and away from saying, hey, why don't I find a group of people who can, in my neighborhood, who want to save the library because it matters to us, you know, so so that that's something that I've sort of unqualified been able to say, you know, this is, this is a, this, this makes a lot of sense, you know, if, if, if your mind is turned towards, towards activism, but I, yeah. You know the old slogan, think locally, act yeah, globally. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we need to think and act yeah, locally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, what I'm seeing with great joy in the United States now is the beginning of more unionization. Mm -hmm. And what I think that goes back to is really what we're talking about is on ground organizing communication and not being afraid 
of the forces who are out there against it. And what I have been watching closely is not only the organizing, but also in particular with Amazon and the workers are organizing for unions. And my question to you is, and again, this is going into the future, do you think that will have any com impact whatsoever on people perhaps using Amazon less? Catherine? So hopefully, but it's hard to know. So a, a couple of different pieces there. So one, I agree that it's been incredibly hopeful because we, we all know the trend, right? I mean, unionization grew dramatically in the post-New Deal era and then really has been substantially declining. And now there is revived interest in trying to understand how we can harness the collective interest and energy of workers to look out for their collective interests. And, and I do think that right now, one of the benefits of the unionization efforts have not only been this limited circumstances where they've already been successful, but they are illuminating the spotlight that we needed on the reality of working in an Amazon warehouse and how dehumanizing it is. And so one of the things I explore and direct is the shift from shorter supply chains where far more people were makers, these highly intermediate worlds also changes the nature of work. It changes the nature of what you're doing because one is you're actually connecting with the people on their side. The Amazon, you're not connecting with anybody but just as importantly, you're treated more likely as fungible because you're part of this overall system. And, and so understanding there's meaningful trade-offs on both sides of that, I, I think is a huge part of it. Thank you. On the other side, really quickly though, is I do think that the, the focus on Amazon workers has been a critical first step, but it's only a first step. And we also need to understand as dehumanizing as the conditions are that they're facing, when we take a broader perspective over all of the workers that are playing a role in the production of most of the goods we're getting on Amazon, a lot of them would, would kill for actually the, the wages and safety and protections that they mm -hmm. would enjoy in an Amazon mm -hmm. warehouse. Time for one final quick question from you, please. Thank you. So my question is for you, Ms. Judge. Um, I do write and work in agri-food trade and in security, and so that's the context I've been thinking about as you're talking about reducing the outsized power of an intermediary. And it seems like it's inevitable that that comes with a raised cost burden on the people who are then producing or consuming goods, uh, especially when it comes to food. So considering the fact that millions of Americans are food insecure and not necessarily hungry, but dependent on systems like Amazon or Walmart to get their basic caloric needs, what mechanisms do you suggest to, to support them when the government may not be able to subsidize them, but the uh, only accessible food that they have is cheap and often non-nutritious? So it's a, a huge set of issues. And, and food insecurity is one of the biggest challenges we face. Bread for the World is actually one of the organizations that I'm most involved with, because I think trying to figure out actually how we use government to address food in, insecurity in the United States and internationally is one of the biggest policy challenges that we face, particularly right now, as we have rising food prices in so many different places, and we have so many more people going hungry, and, and we really are suffering because of it. That being said, I would say food prices, like clothing prices, have been artificially lowered because we're not actually paying the full price of the cost of production. And if we look at what the impact is of current growing practices where we're destroying land, consuming huge amounts of water, and, and using fertilizers that have really adverse consequences in incredible amounts, it's not a sustainable path. So it might seem cheap. On the other hand, I think thinking longer term does start to raise the questions that we do need to answer over how, on the one hand, do we make sure that people get fed? because the, the challenge of living with hunger is incredibly, uh, 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 is an incredible challenge and, and one that really plagues us, but how do we do so in a way that is sustainable for our planet uh, and our communities? We've had a wonderful opportunity to learn about the responsibilities of both uh, co citizens and consumers. I'd like to really give a warm thanks to Gall Beckerman, Catherine Judge for this fantastic discussion. Thank you.